right? Ruthie, Ruthie doesn't really enjoy that. She says, you know, you got an office, right? So Ruthie's blessed me with my very own little room in the house. <laughs> and so uh, I, I went back about four times. And finally, I just said, Lord, I'm, I'm not even going to crack the Bible open until you, until you give me your direction because I'm tired of trying to pursue mine. And you're not anointing it. You ever had a great idea? God, I got a great idea, right? You know, um, I, want you to, I want you to bless my idea, Lord. That's basically what I was doing. And um, that just doesn't work. And I got, this, I got this text from somebody. I got some kind of message. I don't know. You know, you can get so many different kinds of messages on your phone now. You can get a text. You can get an email. You can get a messenger message. I don't know what all that is. Don't think for one minute that if you send me something on Messenger that I'm ignoring you. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not technically all that spiffy when it comes to that stuff. I love you, but I, I'm not really up on all that. A phrase came up in a message someone sent me. And, and it had a, a scripture reference in it. And it had two words in the little paragraph they sent me. I don't remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember who sent it to me. Might have been my brother-in-law, David. How many of you know that doesn't really matter? There were two words that, that as soon as my eyes fell on them, I knew that, oh, those are, the, those are the two words. Those are the words that God wanted me to hear, right? And uh, one of them was no, and one of them was Lord. One was no. And one was Lord. And, and that set me off. I was off to the races. How many, how many of you know and remember uh, that I told you that about trees in the Bible? And that for me, when you take a word like tree in the Bible and you find out that it's in the Bible 300 times, you pay attention to it, right? It's 300 times. That's a pretty good. You know, if a word's in the Bible, and I'm not talking about the and 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 you understand what I'm saying I'm talking about words you know important words and I realized the 300 times the word trees in the Bible and God uses it in the Bible to describe people's character or the character of a nation or the character of a person's spirit you know be like a tree planted by the waters amen in over 300 times a day. so that's been kind of a standard for me just just to note about me to you that's all I'm just making mention of it right well I wanted to know how many times the word no shows up in the Bible and uh, so I did some research found out it's around 1500 times the word no k-n-o-w no so should we pay attention to it so I, I started digging around and wanted to know how many times the word Lord shows up in and when I saw the number, I was astounded. And, and instantly it rose up on the inside of me. That, that's the word in the Bible, the word Lord. That word, not counting the these. You know, the is a pretty popular word, word, right? And and, not those little words. But the word Lord shows up nearly 7,500 times. Should we pay attention to it? We, we should. And all of these things started rising up on the inside, and I knew we had hooked in. <laughs> it, with the, the, the hook is set in me, and the drag is set, and I'm, I'm winding the reel out, right? I'm running with it, right? And so I, I got to thinking about this and how that in, in this, God's revealed to me, quit worrying about the world acknowledging whether I'm God or not because everybody will eventually. Everyone will eventually. So I wrote that title, Know God Now. Okay, um, this, is, this is strange. This is strange to me. Um, I don't know. Who made this graphic for me? I, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but this is not the title of my message. The title of my message is Know God Now or No, N-O, Know God Later. Know God Now or know God later now I'm telling you that's true right 
It, I'm going to tell you, you look at the news headlines, you look at the news headlines today, and I'm telling you that there's not much later. I just don't believe it anymore. Have you noticed how Israel can't do anything to defend itself nowadays without the entire world getting wrapped around the axe of rope? You know, a, a, a weekend or so ago, a week ago, basically, uh, a group of terrorists got into Israel and killed 15 to 1,600 people, and about 500 of them were children. And even in this country here, there were people protesting, screaming how those were the lies of Israel. Propaganda created by Israel. And there were American people screaming at reporters, show me the pictures, show me the pictures. And God sit, rose up and said, you could show them film of it, and they won't believe it. They just won't believe it. That's the level of hatred that's in this world for the Jews. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 11. Ezekiel chapter 11. You know, I love, I love the major and the minor prophets. How do you feel about them? I love them. You know, they... they they cried out in an effort to try to let Israel know God's calling out to you, and you're not answering, you're not listening. It's a perfect picture of the world we're living in today. A major portion of the Old Testament is made up of those major and minor prophets. They're always trying to draw Israel back to God, or they were pronouncing judgment on them because they would not. Does it sound familiar? It's the headlines of the paper today in all reality to the way the world's reacting to God and the way they are, they're so smart, they're so intelligent that they know there's no God. He's not real. He doesn't have any power. He doesn't love us. He doesn't care. Jesus was a good guy maybe, but he really wasn't the son of God. Who could be the son of God? Well, Jesus, amen? Jesus. So they don't know God the way God wants us to know him. And I, I really, I, I, I can't emphasize to you enough, I, I don't mean to um, harp on things or uh, roll things over in your ears so many times that you become, you know, dull of hearing for it. But I'm telling you that God's offering us a very, very, very personal relationship with him now. And we better take advantage of it. We absolutely must take advantage of it. And then you learn things like this, that God uh, wants to make it so personal that you begin to remember the things he says here in the Word. You spend time in the Word, you spend time with him, you talk to him, and he reminds you, these things must come to pass, but do not be afraid. Don't sit here today and let the devil lie to you and, and terrify you about the last days that we're living in and what must come to pass. God tells his children, don't be afraid. And how many of you know we need to obey God? We need to keep his commands. Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 10 says, You shall by the sword, I will judge you. Uh, let's see, let me see verse 10 here. Ezekiel 11, I want to get it right from the book here to make sure I'm getting this right. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know, know what? Know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in the midst of it. I will judge you at the border of Israel. And then the beginning of verse 12 says what? And you shall know that I am the Lord. For you have not walked in my statutes nor obeyed my rules, but have acted according to the rules of the nations that are around you. This phrase is kind of dangerous in a way because, and you shall know that I am the Lord. It, how many of you understand that it's important that we understand and know that he is the Lord today? Not tomorrow, not, a week, not midnight tonight, right now. You need to know that he is the Lord because the only way that people will know he is the Lord later is when every knee bows. You know what I'm saying? Before every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord because confessing it then is not going to save them. 
But God's going to get his due. God's going to get his recognition. And what they know about the Lord then will not save them because it will be too late. And child of God, for us today, the heart's cry of the Spirit of God today is that we draw closer today. That we allow God to teach us what he wants to teach us and say to us what he wants to say to us and to draw us so near that no matter what happens and how much of the end times we're going to get to witness, we will not be afraid. Because the Bible says we don't have to be afraid. I'm convinced that no matter how terrible things look, God will give his children a special grace, a special dispensation. Uh, Do you think Stephen enjoyed being stoned to death? You know, there's a lot of talk about that uh, amongst theologians because it it appeared to me that Stephen uh, partook of something from God, a gift from God, a special grace for being stoned to death. He stood there, he looked to heaven, and while he's being stoned to death, he's asking God to forgive those people that are stoned to death. How many of you know that's not natural? It's supernatural. It's supernatural. He knew something about God that they didn't know. He knew something about God that many people walk on the earth today don't know about God. But we're learning. Amen? Verse 12, And you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes nor obeyed my rules, but have acted according to the rules of the nations that are around you. Uh, You know, I, I, I wrote some things. I just started writing. I wrote this. I really enjoy a good pot. I mean a good cup of coffee in the morning. How many of you knew that about me? I enjoy the taste. I enjoy the aroma. And I consume it for the effect. I like it. This morning at 2.30, my feet hit the ground. I said, thank you, Jesus. And I went straight to the coffee pot. But the whole time, I'm thanking Jesus. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? And, and I get that first cup brewing, and I can smell it. Right? Oh, man, that's so nice. Right? And I thought, what are some of the funny things that people said about coffee? Gene Kerr said, do you know how helpless you feel if you have a full cup of coffee in your hand and you start to sneeze? <laughs> I thought, been there, suffered that, right? Uh, David Lynch wrote, even bad coffee is better than no coffee at all. <laughs> I'm with you, bro. I'm with you. Uh, Deronda Jones, she wrote, drink coffee. Do stupid things faster with more energy. <laughs> I like it. I I think that's encouraging. Uh, On a more serious note, really, have you seen the news lately? You know, most of the time you can't believe what you hear anymore on the news. But it's obvious that bad things are happening. Amen? Israel has reached the point where anything they do to defend themselves is paramount. The throwing a blanket, a planet-sized container of lighter fluid on this world and throwing a match on it. I have been the kind of pastor that has leaned on the idea that if we are people of prayer that are devoted to petitioning God for revival, that we could see the hand of God move again in this world. And once again, we turn to seeking his face with repentant hearts. One of these messages of this ministry has been that we, as children of God, need more so now than ever to pursue a personal, very personal relationship with him. I've told you this before, and I mean it every time I say it. I'm not an eloquent speaker. You know that. I've told you many times. So I have to talk to the church in the only way I know how. Straightforward, honest, and to the point. People, it's time to wake up and smell the spiritual coffee. I want to take some time this morning to examine some important truths that are inescapable. Number one. Everyone will eventually know God. What becomes important is what exactly will you know about God later rather than sooner? I'm here to tell you that people who don't know God now are not going to like what they know about him later. But everyone who has ever lived on this planet or will ever live are going to know him in some form as the Lord. Have you ever heard of the phrase, timing is everything? Turn to your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 
We're going to read the first two verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, first two verses. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to the law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? I have the wrong passage of scripture written down, but I've got the right scripture here. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Everyone will eventually know God. The question is, will it be too late? I love that verse. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, if I've ever stood in this pulpit and tried to scare you, I don't know that I've done that, but I'm going to do it now. If this doesn't scare you, something's wrong with you. If what I'm about to say to you doesn't scare you. How many times have we, as people who call ourselves Christians, have allowed things to remain in our lives simply because we think that grace is going to just continue to cover it? Do we really want to face God with that lie on our lips? That God's okay with us allowing the junk of our lives to just hang on and us keep going back to that same barn and getting kicked by that same mule? I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and try to diminish the power of grace. Grace is very powerful, amen? But you've got to study the word grace and the word of God to learn that it's not there just to cover all of your sins and forgive you for all your sins. There's a power to grace to keep you from sinning. But we don't like that side of the coin as much. We don't lean. Why? Because sometimes it's just plain hard work. It's just hard work sometimes not to do what your flesh wants you to do. But I'm telling you, the days of playing with that is over. It's over. Look at the world around you. It's over. And the reason why people are not flocking to the church to go to an altar and give their heart and life in Jesus is because they see no need. They don't see any difference between the church and the world. So there's no hunger. There's no conviction. There's no power. No power in prayers of people who don't obey God. You cannot do anything to earn the grace of God, but you can do plenty. Uh, let, me, let me change that and modify it so that it fits more clearly. You can't do anything to earn the anointing of God in your life and ministry, but you sure can hinder it easy enough. You can't do anything when it comes to the anointing of God, but put yourself in a position for the Holy Spirit to use you. And it doesn't take much to drive you off of that center point, though and hinder that anointing in your life. I just want God to blow all that out of the water for me. I don't need to be recognized for being a great man of God. I don't have that need in my heart and my life. But I do have a need and recognize it that I need to put myself in a position where I don't hinder God using me. I'm a pastor and a teacher. I don't want anything to stand in the way. You know, this past week, for whatever reason, I wanted to go in my direction, and God said, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm not going to engage you as long as you're pursuing that direction. So I'd say, okay, and I'd get up and go sit somewhere else and wait and then try again. And it wasn't until I recognized what God was saying to me that I ever heard from him again. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. 
For he says, in an acceptable time, I've heard you. And in the day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now, not tomorrow, not tonight, not tomorrow, not next week. I'm telling you, we're at the door. We're at the door. In an acceptable time, I've heard you. And in the day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of our salvation. Like I said, everyone will eventually know God. The question is, will it be too late? Number two, there are three changes that all true believers will receive from a personal relationship with him. I love point two. I love point two. I really do. There are three changes that all true believers will receive from a personal relationship with him. If you're not spending personal quiet time with him, how do you ever expect to hear from him? you don't put yourself in a position to hear from him or to be drawn close to him by by god or you, you being drawn close to him by god if you don't put yourself in a position for that you can't earn that but you sure can't hinder it god builds certain attributes or virtues into his true children that are consistent throughout the family listen to this man when i was young you know the kids uh, aaron leah and nathan man they were an energetic trio children okay they were good kids they weren't bad kids you know um aaron the oldest one the firstborn he he took the brunt of pretty heavy discipline but he was the one who called me one day as an adult and he had a child of his own he said dad did you have to spank me a lot when i was a kid i said you're kidding me man i said son if you didn't get a whooping every day of your life you didn't know you was loved right i said he said every day i said son every day you got a swap for something every day I said, why are you calling me and asking me this? He said, it's Asa, his son, his firstborn son, Asa. He said, Dad, every time I turn around, I'm having to discipline the child. I said, well, son, don't don't worry about it. He's not going to die. It won't kill him, you know. But my point I'm trying to make is this. Aaron and Leah and Nathan, they would find themselves in situations where they're invited to a friend's house, and maybe they went to a party. And maybe you've heard this before about your children. Maybe you haven't. My three children would come home, and these people would say, man, your kids are so well behaved. Now, I'm bragging on God because I, I was not an intelligent child-rearing father. I just I tried to do things with biblical principles. I, I, I um, had a bad temper, and, and I could not allow myself to discipline my children while I was angry. I couldn't do it. You know, didn't want to do that, right? But... They would talk about how good the children were. And I'd say, well, you got to hang up now. i got to go make sure these three children in the back of the house are actually mine, our kids. Have you ever been there? You, you know, but, but in reality, the children, they, they take on the attributes of their mentors, their, their teachers, their parents, their grandparents. And so don't you think that we got that from God? Well, I said, Father, what is it that you're instilling in us then? I want to know. Well, okay, God builds certain attributes or virtues into his true children that are consistent throughout the family. One, the one character mark is wisdom. In James 1, 5, it says, As any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And what is it that God says he'll freely give to us if we ask him? Wisdom. You know, once again, I'm telling you, that's how I learned to enjoy the voice of God. Because something intelligent would rise up on the inside of me that was beyond beyond the intelligence of man. I knew it wasn't me. <laughs> it had to be God because it was smart. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't there, and then it was there, right? So for us as children of God, who who gives greater gifts than we could ever give our children? Amen? The first thing is wisdom. The second thing that the children of God can count on if they just draw near to him is humility. Am I right or wrong? Humility. In Matthew 11, 29, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Isn't that important? For I am gentle and lowly of heart. Did Jesus absolutely have to be gentle and lowly of heart? Well, he's... You know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You know what makes God a God? They can do anything they want, any way they want. 
That's what makes him God, right? But Jesus chose to be uh, gentle and lowly in heart. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It's a character mark for being a child of God. Wisdom, I can count on it. Humility, I have to pursue it, right? And wisdom, you got to ask for it, amen? Isn't there a pursuit involved here? And the third thing, and these are the three character marks of being a child of God. They're not limited to these three, but they're very important. One is wisdom, two is humility, and the third one is courage. This may be the one that's lacking in most people who call themselves Christian today is courage. Every time we turn on the news, there's a temptation to be fearful. There's temptation to doubt God. Will God really take care of me in the end times? Will he really do it? Well, is he a God of his word or not? Wisdom, humility, and courage. Um, the common definition of the word courage is the ability to do something that frightens you. The ability to do something that frightens you. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself said, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Even Jesus said, don't, don't, fear, don't fear the one that can take your life. Fear the one that can pronounce judgment on you and plant your feet in hell. And, and there's, a whole, there's a whole school out there on uh, the, the positive teachings about fearing the correct one, and that's God. A fearful, loving respect for God. Amen? No matter what any human being or demon of hell tries to do against you in your life, you don't have to fear. I mean, if I were the author of this, you should be concerned, but I'm not the author of this. God is the author of this. So, look, if you're lacking in wisdom, talk to God about it. If you're lacking in courage, pursue it from God. Amen. And if you lack you lack courage. Let, let God give it to you. Amen? Because I'm telling you, this isn't no feel-good message, right? This isn't no, no honey-on-the-lips message. I'm telling you, God's telling me to tell you to get ready for what's coming. And getting ready for what's coming is letting these things operate and run your life. Letting this be the road map for your life. Third thing. Knowing God when it's too late is part of what makes hell, hell. Knowing God when it's too late is part of what makes hell, hell. I've been wondering, do I really have to elaborate on this point? How many of you know that the word of God says hell is hot? It's an amazing thing about that teaching. You know, if the Bible says hell is hot, it's hot, right? I mean, the word of God doesn't lie, right? One of the reasons why I think hell is hot is everyone in the room has a reference point for being burned, right? I mean, I don't know why, but in the police academy, they ask us, as a police officer, would you rather go to a gunfight or a knife fight? And overwhelmingly, the police officers, the cadets would say, I'd rather go to a gunfight than a knife fight. There's a psychology behind that, and I'm not much of an academic, but I, I, I taught this at the academy. People don't want to go to a knife fight because most everybody has been cut. Just about everybody has a point of reference for being cut. 
but they don't, the normal person just doesn't have a point of reference for being shocked. So psychologically, a person, human nature will choose, I'll go to the gunfight, maybe I'll get the first round off. Maybe they'll miss me and I won't miss. You understand, this, this is the mentality of a cop, right? But I don't know of any cop that said, I want to go to a gunfight or a knife fight instead of a gunfight. They just don't choose the knife fight. So what's my point? It's important that the word of God warns us that hell is hot, right? We can understand that hell is hot. Why? Because is there anybody in the room that's not been burned at some time in your life? So the point of reference that's that big key point of reference in the word of God for hell is that it's hot and you don't want to go there. Hoping that in the wisdom of God it'll be a deterrent to you. But that's not what's going to make hell hell. You know, the idiots in the world love to argue about philosophy like, could God um, make a log that's so heavy you can't pick it up? Well, you know, we could say, well, God, God, we can say two things. God can do anything he wants to do, right? Um, but, but he can't make a log too big because he's too strong. No, listen to me. Just stick with God can do anything he wants to do. Don't argue with feeble-minded people over things that just don't matter, right? All right? Because there'd be a time people would tell you that God cannot die in any form, but yet Jesus gave up his life on the cross for us. Why? Because he's God and he can do anything. So, can there be some space in, in, in God's creation where the Spirit of God doesn't exist. Don't, don't nod, don't say anything. Let me warn you, there is. Because God's God. If he decides to remove his presence completely from a place, he can do it. There has not been a man, woman, or child that's ever lived in this realm that uh, has, has been in a place where they could not sense the presence of God. It's so common. The presence of God in the world is so, is so common because he's everywhere. He's God, right? That they, they would not know what it was like for the presence of God to be gone until it's gone. What will make, what will make hell hell is that when God goes to shut the opening to hell up, he will withdraw his presence from that place and that's what will make hell hell is that there will be no inkling no presence because God by his own strength and his own power and his own wisdom will withdraw himself from that place that's why I said knowing God when it's too late is part of what makes hell hell. God's going to withdraw his presence from that place. I don't care if you're old. I don't care if you're young. I don't care if you're middle-aged. Hear my voice. It's been my prayer that this message today would touch us in a way that would not only want us to get past all the junk in our lives and draw closer to God, but that we would feel what this world's going through and how many unsaved people there are. And that will make it a prayer. To me, if I don't have anything else in the revival that I'm praying for, it's for us to get right with God, to live in the righteousness that God, only God can give, and to pray for the lost, that the apathy, and the demonic forces that keep them blind and keep them deaf and keep them from hearing and receiving the truth that would set them free. That's, the, that's, all, that's all I really crave for in the revival right now is for us to draw closer and for the lost and the unsaved to once again be drawn by the Spirit of God to the altar and to give their hearts and lives to Jesus. That's my heart cry. 
You know, of course, one of the reasons why I'm talking to you this way today and one of the reasons why I'm so moved by this message is there's no way in the world that Val and myself and the rest of the missions team can get ready to go to India and leave any junk in, in the way. Because that just would be dangerous, wouldn't it, Val? We're not going to live that way, are we? We're not going to live that way. Look, look. I hope and pray that you thank God that you're part of a church where we, we think like this, we talk like this, we pray like this, we pursue the word like this so that we're ready for what's about to unfold. This is just the beginning of the end. We're just seeing the beginning of the end. If this makes you uncomfortable, good. Good. That means there's still... There's still, you know, uh, room for the light in there and for change and for depth of growth, growth in our lives in the spirit of God. So I wrote, I've been wondering, do I really have to elaborate on this point? Well, I did it anyway, right? I said, I can't imagine, neither do I wish to imagine what that feeling will be like when every knee bows and every tongue confesses, amen, that Jesus Christ is Lord. For many of us, it will be very humbling, uh, humbling because we know we've lived. A, you know what faithfulness to God is? It's living a life for God over the long run. You understand what I'm saying? Over the longevity of a life. Not that you did everything perfect, but that you were constantly. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, I just thank God. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm not in the spirit. I'm in the flesh. But I'm telling you, I never get far away from thinking about, look, I'm 67. If I get 20 more years on this earth of Jesus, Terry, I want to spend it with you. God's the only one that can change that because I'm not going to go looking. You see what I'm saying? To go do something different or be somewhere else. I want to be with you because you put up with me. You listen to me. You hear me. When I'm wrong, you forgive me because don't dig too deep in it, but once and then again, now and again, I'm wrong. I'm wrong, right? Uh, but you're very forgiving. You don't come looking for blood. You don't, you know, thank you. You pray for me. I know you do. Don't try to hide it. Amen? That feeling that people will have when they bow the knee to God and confess that he is Lord for the very first time, because that's, that's where a lot of people, that's going to be the first and only time they do it. Amen? Remember what I said? Timing is everything. Confess that he is Lord now, while it is yet day. So I want to close out our time together by looking at a passage of Scripture that should add some clarity to our goal this morning. Our goal is to draw closer to God. Amen? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We like to celebrate birthdays around here. Well, we enjoy a little laughter, right? But when it comes time to get serious in the Word, we get serious in the Word. Amen? Well, there's a birthday here that I, I love to celebrate. In Acts chapter 2, look at verse 14. What is it? We don't, we don't really realize this all the time, but the day of Pentecost was the birthday of the church. Did you know that? The day of Pentecost was the birthday of the church. Happy birthday to the church. Amen? All right. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. And first of all, the whole sermon, theologians tell us, is it, his talking didn't last more than 20 minutes and 2,000 people got saved. I said, come on, Lord. I preach longer than 20 minutes. Can I get 4,000? You know? But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And what did Joel say? And, and the Holy Spirit directed Peter to say this on the birthday of the church. And in the last days, we've been living in the last days for 2,000 years. 
the church age is the last days. I, I mean, am I twisting the word here? Am I making something up? In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. In other words, the end of it. I call it the end of the end. Amen? Do you, do you, do you see it, though? Do you see it coming? And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what? shall be saved, not part way, not half way, not one-tenth, they'll be saved. You know, in, in a way, I admire these people in the early church because, um, you know, I uh, heard someone say the other day, there are people who will decide, I don't want to go to church today. I don't, for whatever reason, I'm not mad at them. I don't know what, what all the reasons are that they don't come. You know, I'd kind of like to look at me. Maybe I'm not the kind of pastor that draws a crowd. I don't know. I just know that I need to obey God and preach his word. Amen? But there are those I know for a fact, not rumor, that they'll decide not to come to church, but they can binge watch a program all weekend long. They got no problem with that. Hey, let's just call it like it is. Amen. I can't think of any place on Sunday I'd rather be than with God and you. You know, this is, man, this is fun. It's fun. There's nothing more fun than this. There's nothing better on God's green earth I'd rather do than be with you on Sunday morning and with God. Because he's the one that makes the reason we come together all good. Amen? Have you ever read Reader's Digest version of a book or a novel before in your life? I used to love to read Reader's Digest because they could take a great book and put it in a size I could handle. <laughs> right? The passage of Scripture, this passage of Scripture is about the subject of the church age encapsulated from beginning to end. That's what that passage of Scripture is about in Acts chapter 2. Right? Remember. It all ends well for the people of God who determine to know him as God before it was too late. If you're in this room today, don't feel too bad because you're here. Don't let the devil lie to you about maybe you're too far gone because if you were too far gone, you wouldn't even be in the room and you wouldn't care. You might be home binge watching something. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying the people that binge watch stuff on, on at home and on TV are going to hell. I didn't say that. Don't go out and miss, man, miss, you know. Uh, what do you mean you was been watching? Pastor talked about you Sunday. <laughs> it is a problem for you hanging out with pastors and living your life however you feel like it because you're subject to being a sermon illustration, right? You know, my kids could say, yeah, you could come over and play at our house, but be careful around my dad or you'll end up in a sermon illustration, right? <laughs> my kids weren't dumb, you know. They, they knew what the warnings were. I could not help but sit at the table and dry tears from my eyes because I had heard from God. Don't let this sermon make your heart feel so heavy that you don't know what to do or that you can't move forward. If there's all kinds of mixed emotions in you right now, what does Pastor Dennis say to do? Talk to God. Talk to God. If you want to know, God, what is my place in the end times and how am I going to live my life that gives honor to you? As I live through as much of the end times that you're going to have me live in, you talk to God about it. 
if you have a desire in your heart birthed by God to be pleasing to him, and no matter what happens, then you've got to talk to God about it. I'm telling you that that day that Stephen stood up and looked to God and asked him to forgive those people who were throwing rocks at him, taking his life, he didn't make his decision that day to be that way. He had talked to God about being pleasing to God before that day. I used to teach this at the academy, tell cadets. Some of you in this room, um, you'll get through this academy and you'll go to a training officer. And on a Friday night, you're going to be in a bar and a fight's going to break out and your training officer is probably going to get hit. And if you don't engage and you don't help your training officer, it's going it's to be bad. You're probably not going to get through the FTO program. But some of you are going to engage, you're going to get hit, and you're going to go home that night, and you're never going to put the uniform on again. And you're never going to wear the badge, and you're not going to carry the gun. You're not going to do the job because you're not called to do the job. And then I went on to the harsh part. What are you willing to do to make another human being let go of you? If they put their hands on you, what are you willing to do to them to make them let you go to save your own life? What are you willing to bite off? You understand what I'm saying? Isn't that terrible? I said, look, you don't like the sound of that, Emily, and you don't like the sound of it here. But I'm telling you, some of you are going to go into spiritual fights. You better know how to wield the name of Jesus, amen, to win the fight. What I tried to tell these officers, and it bears true of you today, you can't wait till you get in that fight to decide what you want to do. Because if you get in that fight and it's never crossed your mind, it's too late. It's too late. Right now, the end times are going pretty easy on us here at Foothills Bible Church, aren't they? I mean, right here in the room, it's going pretty good for us, right? It's not always going to be that way. The end times just get worse and worse and worse. Talk to God about it now. Amen. Get serious about your relationship now. Don't wait. Because if you wait, you can wait till it's too late. Amen. All right. That's right. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. I love you guys. Thank you for putting up with me. Stand up with me, please. I know I mention this pretty often, but Jack, thanks again for building these altars for us. One day, we're going to spend time around them because there ain't no choice. These altars, they're a place to meet with God. How many times do you hear me say, uh, talk to God about it? Well, where do you go? Sometimes you need to go to a place that's set aside for that. All right? So, you know, don't, don't feel conjoled today. Just listen to the Spirit of God. And, and I'm going to plant this seed in your heart. Remember, in this church, the altars are a place that you can go to any time you want during the service. I don't care what it is you're facing or what the need is uh, or what you're going through. You're never going to distract me by going to the altar. I don't care if it's in the middle of singing. I don't care if it's in the middle of my sermon. Never put off obeying the Holy Spirit when he speaks to you and tells you, there's something I want to fix. Will you give it to me? And the altar is a place you need to go to do it. Then do it. And... While I'm praying, if you want to come down to these altars and spend some time with God, we're not going to rush. There's going to be, if it's not today, it's very soon. Listen to my voice. We'll move into a time of the service where God wants to move and God wants to do and God wants to draw people closer and God wants to forgive sins and God wants to set people free. God wants to save people. When you start looking around and the people that are sitting in, near you in this room, 
are people you've never seen before and they don't know Jesus and they don't even know why they're here. But they want to come down and give their heart and life to Jesus. That's revival. That's revival. And so how the services will, will end then is we start giving altar calls and people start coming down and the, the elders of the church and the leaders will be praying with people and talking with people and counseling with people and seeing people set free. And at that point, if, if God's finished with you, you take your fellowship out to the lobby. You understand what I'm saying? Because we love to fellowship. Do you realize we've got that down pat here? And it's good. That's not bad. That's not, a, that's not a bad thing. That is a good thing. Why? Because we, by jinkies, are family. In the name of Jesus, we're family. And if God's not dealing with you about something that day and God doesn't have you coming down to put a hand on someone's shoulder to pray for them and to help them, and all, you take your fellowship out to the fellowship hall. And that's when you know the service is over for you. But it's not over for the people around the altar. I'm going to coach you on the altars of the church until... The Holy Spirit begins to move in a way that people start getting comfortable with the idea of taking things to the altar. All right? All right? And if this is your time and your day, you do it, right? Because I'm telling you this right now. Some of you did get a stirring in your hearts today. I know you did. I know how people will get nervous and say, God, am I, am I pleasing to you? It's a good question. Amen? And there's nothing like talking to God to let God fix things for you. Amen? So I want to pray for us, and if you want to come down and spend a little bit of time at this altar, we're going we're gonna to go with God. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you, Lord, for people that are stirred in their spirits right now, Lord God. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, for a good old-fashioned altar is a place to meet with you. Father, we have a desire to know you now, not later. We thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us afresh and new of all of our sins, all of our shortcomings. Father, like Stephen, I know it wasn't that day that he died that he decided to have the kind of relationship with you that he exhibited that day. You had been building that in him, Father, and he'd been letting you. And he did not allow obstacles to stand between or hinder, Father, what it was you were wanting to do in his life. And what a powerful testimony. We don't know of anyone else in the word of God that Jesus, at the right hand of the Father, stood up to receive Stephen from this realm to his presence. Lord, give us that spirit like Stephen to pray for those who try to do us harm and mean ill will to us. Help us to be ready for that time, that hour, of that moment. When we leave this realm and enter into your presence, may it not take us by surprise, Lord. May it not be overwhelming to us, because it wasn't overwhelming to Stephen. He was ready. Father, help us to live our lives, whether we're 20 more years or 50 more years or 75 more years or whatever. Help us to ever be growing in our faithfulness to you, the sensitivity of your leading, your voice in our lives by the power of your spirit. Thank you for sharing us uh, with us today, Lord, that uh, this whole world's going to know that you're Lord. We need to know it today, Father. We need to allow your spirit to show us and teach us today that you are Lord, Father. Be Lord of our lives. Every corner, every nook, cranny. Father, I need young men and women in this church to understand the desperate need this world has for great men and women of God to be uh, raised up in the church, Father. It means forsaking the things of this world and the things that would hinder your anointing, Father. We don't want to hinder your anointing. Lord, it says in your word that in the last days you'll pour out your spirit upon all flesh. Lord, it's been a long time since we've seen the gifts of the Spirit in full operation in the body of Christ, and it ought not to be so. Lead us, guide us, direct us, teach us, fill us, Father, to overflowing, and distribute your gifts among the body of Christ the way only your Spirit can, Father. May we always, Father, 
be humble. No matter how you use us, Father. Take no pride in ourselves, Father. But only gratitude, a heart of gratitude for what you're doing in us, to us, and through us. Father, I love you. I thank you for everything you're doing in our lives, Father. Continue to pour your word into us, Lord. Change us for your glory day by day by day. Build faithfulness into us, Father, so that we serve you over the length of our life, Father. No no ups and downs, no ins, no outs. It's all in, Father, for your glory. Mm, Praise you, Father. Thank you for teaching us about worship, Lord. Father, help us that when we raise hands to you, Lord, it's the right motives, Father desires give them to us and then fulfill them we pray in jesus name may we do what we do not as show father but from a heart of gratitude and love and adoration father. we have so much to learn father teach us we pray pour your word into us and touch our understandings open our eyes open our ears father in jesus mighty name we pray and praise amen and amen. There's still time and still room around these altars. You can feel free to be dismissed. And you can move your fellowship to the, to the lobby. And we'll continue to let God do what he wants to do in here until he's done. Amen.